you for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the, the title of today's webinar is called Medicare Preventive Visit Coverage, Benefits and Effects of ACA Policy Changes on Older Adults with Multiple Chronic Conditions. This webinar series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an NIA-funded initiative that bridges the expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions. The two powerhouses are the Healthcare Systems Research Network and the Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Centers, or Pepper Centers as they're known. The initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gurowitz at the University of Massachusetts and the Myers Primary Care Institute, along with co-PIs Elizabeth Bayliss and Jay Magaziner. My name is Alexandra Hajduk, and I am new faculty at the Yale School of Medicine and a member of the Aging Initiatives Dissemination Workgroup. I'm joined today by Dr. Heather Whitson, who's faculty at the Duke Pepper Center and co-leader of the Dissemination Workgroup, along with Leah Hansen at Health Partners. Before we get started today, I need to cover a few technical details. Due to the number of registrants for today's webinar, we've placed the phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. Unless you're logged in as a host or a panelist, your line should be muted. However, we welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A or chat features of the webinar software. If you're in your Cisco webinar portal, under the tab that says Presentation, and you look to the upper right, you should see an icon for chat and an icon for Q&A. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Heather and I will keep an eye out for these questions um, under the Q&A icon. And as time permits, we'll, we will read the questions for our speaker after the presentation. If you have any technical or logistical issues, we ask that you submit those under the chat function. Please ensure you're identified by either your name or your participant ID, so our webinar hosts will be able to help troubleshoot any problems you're having. With the chat function, you can choose whether you'd like your comment to be visible to all participants, or you can choose to send the question only to the host. Today, I extend a huge thank you to Catherine Anzuoni, Valentina Landon, and Joanne Wagner and their team, who do amazing work behind the scenes to make these aging initiative webinars possible. They'll be monitoring the chat functions today and will help with technical troubleshooting. So that housekeeping is done, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Michael Malone is an academic geriatrician and the Medical Director of Senior Services at Aurora Healthcare in Wisconsin. Dr. Malone is also the Medical Director of Aurora at Home and Geriatric Medicine Fellowship Program Director for Aurora. He serves as the Chair of the Public Policy Committee for the American Geriatric Society, and he represents the AGS on the Macrocardiovascular Disease and Neuropsychiatric Disease Management Clinical Subcommittees. These subcommittees make recommendations to CMS on episode group payments to Medicare providers. <clears throat> In addition, Dr. Malone is the section editor of the Models of Care section of the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and he joined his co-authors on a book which will be released next month called The Essentials of Clinical Geriatrics, 8th edition, um, by Kane, Auslander, Resnick, and Malone. Suk Young Chung, a PhD, is a health economist and an assistant scientist at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation's Research Institute. Dr. Ch primary research interest our phys physician performance assessment and compensation. With her recently completed career development award funded by the AHRQ, she examined the scope of primary care physician work and how this work relates to billing of visit type and level and physician compensation. The pilot study that she'll discuss today that was funded by the Aging Initiatives is an extension of this work. Please uh, welcome Drs. Malone and Chung. Yeah, Catherine, do you want me to start first? That'd be great. Well, I'm just going to share my screen. And Amy, does the uh, patient okay? Yes. 
So thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate the uh, invitation to the aiding initiative. And what I'd like to do is to uh, really kind of uh, look at a number of uh, issues in regards to the uh, ACA and uh, walk through uh, the ACA uh, with you so that we can kind of look at the implications of the Affordable Care Act and uh, specifically in regards to uh, vulnerable older adults those with multiple chronic conditions. Okay, so um, this one. Oh, okay, here we go. So I have conflict of interest to report in regards to this uh, presentation, and I'm going to do my best to stay entirely neutral in regards to describing uh, the policy, uh, these important policy changes and these important policies that are in place. I'll stay super neutral, and uh, but understand that a lot of people have uh, strong opinions in regards to uh, any of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So what I do is to really outline this um, Affordable Care Act um, and the impact that this uh, important legislation has had on Americans. And I'll do my best to be able to highlight the impact for older Americans. We're going to think through and study the, how the law has increased coverage uh, and uh, the nuances in regards to those with multiple chronic conditions. Um, we'll also study, and I'll try to uh, synthesize the important points in regards to how the Affordable Care Act has had an impact on our healthcare delivery system. We'll look at like what happened last week, and I'll try to synthesize that in a way that uh, puts it all together. We'll look at at what the changes that were being proposed and what happened, and then we'll look at kind of the implications uh, for vulnerable older adults, and then we'll kind of come full circle in regards to thinking about, well, what did American Geriatric Society say about this, and uh, what could uh, a um, nutrition, a health sciences researcher, an American do in order to respond to all of these things, uh, the prior uh, five bullet points. This is background. So this group knows well the importance of the uh, ones whom we serve uh, with multiple chronic uh, conditions. Uh, there's, you know, millions of older Americans who face Medical conditions on a daily basis, and uh, their care is important to us. Uh, it's important to them, it's important to their family caregivers, and uh, uh, it's important to Medicare, who, who has the responsibility of developing and sustain health care systems that, that uh, account for uh, the needs of these folks and uh, in a high quality, uh, patient centered strategy uh, that, that manages costs uh, uh, efficiently. The four elements of care uh, for these folks are outlined uh, on a JAMA uh, paper from 2010, uh, which I enjoyed uh, reading. So um, I, I'm pivoting now to the Affordable Care Act. Um, I, I tried to synthesize this very large legislation uh, on uh, a, a couple of slides. I do my best to highlight the most important parts of the this act so that you have an understanding of the implications uh, uh, of this legislation uh, so that you can kind of understand it at uh, a uh, higher level. So there, the really uh, important 
aspect of the Affordable Care Act was that uh, it mandated um, health insurance coverage for individuals. Um, I, I, those who did not have uh, insurance coverage were uh, uh, subject to a penalty. So that was accomplished in a number of different ways. Um, uh, number one, the issue of Medicaid uh, it, within 28 states in the District of Columbia, initially, until at the federal government's expense, non-elderly adults with below a certain level uh, of the, the poverty level. And that uh, will uh, recipient uh, the uh, is coverage to approximately uh, 10 to 11 million individuals. Next, the uh, way that this Affordable Care Act had an impact was by providing subsidized insurance either uh, through state exchanges or through federal insurance marketplaces uh, for individuals and in some cases for small businesses. Um, so that had an impact of another uh, about 11 to 12 million. Other, um, as was uh, a, a impact on uh, our daughter, uh, she at the age of uh, maybe 23 till actually uh, this month received uh, coverage through uh, her parents' uh, health insurance, and she, as well as uh, three million others, uh, received access to health insurance coverage through this. this through this mechanism. Further, um, health insurance companies were prevented uh, from uh, terminating coverage on those who either already had pre-existing conditions or who had insurance coverage but actually became sick and then were um, uh, previously dropped off the, the rolls. Um, that had an impact on 10 million. And then there was further coverage uh, that eliminated the uh, out, many out-of-pocket costs for per services. So, uh, in short, uh, this legislation had an impact on, um, I'd say, tens of millions of individuals in our country. The costs are noted in blue. I'm going to put it red, but I just chose to make it really neutral and leave it as in blue. So you can see that the big cost implications with B, in this sense, billions um, in the Medicaid expansion, all the insurance exchanges, tax credits, uh, and then the um, those are the some of the costs that I was able to find. The slide points out, well, what are the implications uh, of uh, made coverage? Well, it really has uh, resulted in the uh, greater access to uh, health insurance and an increased number of those who are uninsured in our country from around 41 million down to approximately 27 million. Um, so that actually was a big deal, and we'll talk about it again in just a few moments with another slide. So there were non-elderly adults who did not get care because of costs. So in other words, uh, people uh, were more willing to go to the doctor, uh, their nurse practitioner, in order to get addressed uh, because they were able to afford it. Further, um, they were uh, gaining this insurance coverage, increased the likelihood that they had a specific site where they uh, usually received their care. So that is an access issue. It is coverage for, obviously, for hospital as well as emergency department care. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then improved access for important um, as to individuals' health, such as behavioral health. And this all 
uh, up to uh, in the context of those with chronic conditions is the possibility that uh, most folks who were able to take care of themselves receive a program as younger or middle-aged adults that they would have um, had access to coverage by uh, at a age and then eventually become eligible for Medicare. A uh, slide uh, was obtained from a really good New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper that kind of celebrated and described the Affordable Care Act after five years. And in blue, you can see the percent of uninsured individuals in America, um, uh, you know, gradually decreased. It looks like when I looked at this at the six-year mark, not uh, with another reference, generally the rate of uninsured has dropped. It really depends on how they assess it and measure it, but it's the consistently uh, indications are that. Uh, the number of uninsured Americans has, in fact, uh, the percentage of uh, adults with uh, out insurance has decreased. Um, and then again, the uh, other concepts that are important here is that, that folks had better access to primary care and they reported us uh, troubles uh, that they, 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 they um, uh, sufficient resources in order to go get uh, the care that they needed. So I really enjoyed the next paper that was in uh, uh, JAMA Internal Medicine um, in October of 2016. And what they did was uh, really quite interesting. So they saw uh, three states uh, in the South, uh, places where I I, uh, I train and where I, I grew up and where I still I uh, have a real kind of a sense of uh, belonging. Um, so Texas, and then they also looked at uh, Arkansas and Kentucky, and Kentucky, and they they noted that, that Arkansas and Kentucky like opted in to the Medicaid expansion, and Texas opted out. So what it was they looked at. Uh, three different time points um, at these three different states, and they called folks uh, and asked them uh, about their health insurance coverage and another uh, a number of different uh, aspects of their uh, uh, health utilization, uh, both before, during, and after the implementation of, of the Medicaid expansion. So you can see in the figure, and I put a little blue arrow uh, in regards to Texas, that the uninsured rate uh, went, uh, but in Arkansas, Kentucky, it went down as well. It looks like um, considerably uh, uh, remarkable rate. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of showed the results of the Medicaid expansion. Um, and they looked, they described further in this paper, which I'd encourage you to take a look at. Uh, in, again, the theme of improved access to primary care, uh, better self reported health, uh, uh, more likely uh, approach to uh, address their chronic conditions. Um, they, the folks, went to the emergency department less, in, but they, they instead attended their needs uh, with primary care visits and patient visits more. They also, um, uh, related to this conversation, were likely to have received appropriate screening. So uh, uh, that was a that was keeper uh, for me, that particular paper helped me to better understand the implications of the Affordable Care Act. So if there's implications, again, in regards to uh, the risk of uninsured, so they went down, the, uh, the access to primary care services, that went up. And then there's so the health care delivery system, that were also like 
put into this big act called the Afford Care Act, and I'll highlight some of those for you because they have even more implications specifically on older adults and with multiple chronic conditions. So specifically within the Affordable Care Act was, I'll say, a booster dose um, of incentives and penalties to reduce Medicare readmissions. And there were a number of additional uh, to reduce hospital acquired uh, conditions. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. There are also a, a additional uh, to this legislation that resulted in a redistribution of uh, Medicare payments for a variety of costs and quality uh, measures above and on the readmissions and the never events. Um, also, with the Affordable Care Act, what was uh, packed in this, uh, this idea of bundle payment initiatives that set a single payment for hospitals, physicians, and post-acute services or a given procedure or condition. And finally, in terms of the, how the Affordable Care Act affected the, the our care delivery system, uh, Affordable Care Act like really pushed the uh, uh, development of and the dissemination of accountable care organizations, uh, which are encouraging uh, the integration and the coordination of the care and uh, the taking responsibility for the cost and the quality of care for beneficiaries. So there's hundreds of such uh, programs called ACOs now, as you're well aware, in America. And the uh, when, in re again, in the context of care older adults with multiple chronic conditions, the quality measures uh, in those of who fit in Medicare shared, shared savings programs uh, are actually better than those in uh, uh, standard fee-for-service Medicare. So again, uh, this is all a part of the Affordable Care Act. In addition, in regards to our health care delivery system, um, the Affordable Care Act created the CMI uh, which was funded through this mechanism uh, for a billion dollars per year for 10 years. And as you know, it was with uh, improving quality, reducing costs for Medicare and Medicaid programs. And the, um, the CMS, or the Secretary of the um, Medicare and Medicaid, is able to look at these best models and best practice models and figure out which ones of those models are able to improve quality without increasing costs. Uh, can like push those, uh, disseminate them without further approval by uh, Congress. Examples of these uh, wonderful programs that have been stimulated by the CMMI include a fabulous program at UCLA that promotes uh, domestic better dementia care for individuals who have cognitive impairment, uh, nurses and nurse practitioners. The wonderful program called Hospital at Home at Mount Sinai, and a fabulous program as well at Indiana University to uh, improve the coordination of care and the uh, care delivery to long-term uh, residents in skilled nursing facilities. Um, again, there are full examples of um, the, I'll say the Affordable Care Act. Uh, all of this, in addition, um, um, coupled with, with uh, strategies within or mechanisms within this uh, Affordable Care Act that improve some of the solvency of uh, Medicare Part A, which uh, extended like the length of time in which that uh, uh, hospital insurance trust fund should be solvent. The next two slides just simply point out, like most importantly, the uh, decrease in the 30-day readmission rate among Medicare beneficiaries, uh, perhaps 
uh, to the uh, various penalties and uh, strategies within the Affordable Care Act. And then likewise, importantly, uh, the, the change of these uh, hospital acquired conditions called never events, which were really um, promoted again uh, by the Affordable Care Act. And then the next slide simply looks at the near Medicare spending projections, uh, which a part of uh, have a, a decreased in the rate of growth hence uh, uh, for the first time in a while, the care uh, beneficiary expenditures uh, have decreased, and um, again, perhaps in um, either related to or uh, currently with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So again, all folks are affected by the Affordable Care Act. I'd say a preponderance of the, as best I can understand, of the impact of the Affordable Care Act is on, uh, you know, the access uh, for health insurance for uh, younger adults, younger Americans. But again, the Affordable Care Act has a big impact on dual eligible, those who have Medicaid, obviously on poor, um, as you hear shortly from Dr. Chung, uh, those who have uh, conditions who really require uh, wellness uh, visits uh, to be able to assess and screen for those conditions and those who are in long-term care programs. So as I was kind of looking at this and like uh, reading and studying like all that's in the Affordable Care Act, I'm to the conclusion of like, uh, I kind of like it. It's really an amazing impact on millions of folks. So then I thought, well, what, what's the problem here? So the challenges. And I'll try to outline them uh, for you. So our, uh, the premiums have gone up from year to year. Um, and it's, it's kind of complex, uh, to say the least. Um, and I'll try to, uh, let's say, parse out and articulate some of the complexities that are relevant to you. Um, so it, uh, some of the premium increases have been um, let's say higher in some markets than in others. Um, and some of the uh, impacts of the Affordable Care Act may vary from state to state. So uh, plans um, have high deductibles and high co-pays uh, in effort to keep the premiums down, and others have restricted access in order to control costs. Um, these insurance marketplace products um, in counties have dropped considerably, thus limiting choice for individuals, and that uh, perhaps makes it uh, such that the costs uh, for those plans go up, uh, and that's been a struggle. Um, the other thing is that, um, um, oh, the requiring full coverage of, of multiple conditions um, has added costs to the insurance company, and uh, having like standards for what these policies must be like have um, like added costs as well. Um, although, uh, some of the states have chosen to uh, be a part of the Medicaid extension, such as uh, 31 states, and others have not. So, since over as the federal subsidy for that expansion uh, has decreased, uh, that leaves states with more responsibility in order to sustain uh, appropriate coverage. And then the impacts on small businesses who may hire lots of time folks. Um, other research that I saw or papers and such that I studied uh, shows that, in fact, the employment is um, and not down in regards to the implications 
terms of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and there's the cost. So it, when we start to look at the cost of this project, of uh, this act, it's big. Um, and it kind of depends on the time interval that is decided. But so some intervals are 10 years, some are expressed in 11. But it's uh, not like about millions or billions. Now we're talking trillions. 1.76 trillion in costs, um, but there's uh, in fact taxes and there's cost savings. So some of it is kind of offset by uh, costs are offset by taxes and cost savings. So there's uh, important economic uh, implications to this bill. So it happened uh, last week, and then I'll try to. Uh, um, size so a few closing comments. So last week uh, there was a lot going on. So as you know, the House bill passed in 2017 in May, and then the CBO indicated uh, in their report that because that the House bill would actually knock 15 million uh, Americans off their health insurance over a 10-year period. The Senate took it up. Um, on July 25th, and a lot happened uh, immediately, like within uh, uh, like a, a cluster of days. Um, there was an act to replace and repeal, and then which failed, and then uh, Care Reconciliation Act, which was simply a repeal, and then a skinny repeal, which I'll comment on in a moment is less likely to have an impact at all on the uh, Medicaid expansion. So it's uh, ultimately uh, uh, as well. And in blue, you can see the number of Americans who would have been knocked off their health earnings over a period of 10 years. So what was the skinny repeal and what was the big deal about that that ultimately, I'll say, culminated in thumbs down? point of the skinny repeal was, um, I guess, a drop of the individual mandate as well, um, a, an effort to increase uh, the on contributions to health savings accounts, the um, waiving of some of these minimum bet set of benefits, and getting, um, unfortunately, the uh, and, and the top prospect of eliminating funding for prevention and public health programs. So this uh, was voted on, and uh, it became quite interesting at the end, um, as I had indicated before, uh, it just barely um, uh, failed in, um, uh, it, it just barely, barely failed in the Senate, and it, it, it's quite interesting how it could have actually either gone to a committee uh, between the House of Representatives and Senate. It could have actually gone straight to be signed. So uh, because of that uncertainty, um, in part, Senator McCain put his thumb down. So a few points in regards to the context of our organization, American Geriatric Society, have advocated in the context of the, the considerations for the repeal of the Affordable Care Act we, uh, in the public policy committee and, and the leadership of the American Geriatric Society uh, advocate that, that Americans should have access to health insurance and that if there's going to be a change in the coverage for, for the access to insurance for Americans that there should be time to discuss such uh, policy and debate how that should be uh, managed. Um, likewise, um, I, this is important and it's like if the Affordable Care Act becomes repealed, it's going to have a big time effect on states and their ability to bring resources to or continue coverage for Medicaid recipients. And that hence has a big impact on uh, adults with multiple conditions. And 
um, Jelly, the injury Actual study, I'll say specifically uh, opposes the Medicaid changes to Medicaid that reduce access to those who need such services. And uh, American Geriatric Society, as you would expect, uh, really likes the SMI and all the work they're doing to improve models of care, especially that work for those who have chronic conditions, multiple chronic conditions. So, uh, what next? Where does the legislation go from here? Uh, it kind of depends, but uh, President Trump has encouraged uh, Congress to try again. And other times he says, uh, just let it fail and then go at it and try to fix it there. Uh, and he's had other tweets that uh, have, let's say, um, threatened the, uh, the payment to uh, insurance companies who are actually providing coverage. So, in part, I think that, that it, this still the need. I'll comment about it in a moment. What can you do? Um, I think you can read. You go to the Family Foundation and uh, hang out there and read some of the uh, uh, topics that come up that they. Uh, print in a very unbiased strategy. Uh, you can be a good listener and try to understand, you know, this bill and the implications on uh, the Americans uh, in their health care. You can uh, champion, as you already are doing, the improvements in care for older Americans and uh, for improvements in our health care delivery system. So that folks get a quality care, um, that's important and part of our values. You can join the American Geriatric Society Public Policy Committee because we need really bright people like you to who understand uh, the important implications of excellent care for individuals, bringing excellent care to uh, our healthcare systems. You can write your con congressional representative, your senator. Um, and you can, uh, if you just do so, tweet. So here's some key themes just to kind of pull it all together. The effect really has had uh, major implications as to access to health insurance, access to care for Americans. Um, that's a big bill, and it's affected millions. This Affordable Care Act. Uh, it had big and broad and important implications to how our healthcare delivery system has worked over the last several years and how it is likely to work into the future. Um, it turns out that last week uh, it was all uh, kind of uh, teetering, and um, I, it, that was kind of a big deal. And I think that it still may be vulnerable. And there are actually several important issues that are within this Affordable Care Act that actually should be addressed to make it better uh, and to uh, improve the health care delivery system for America and particularly for vulnerable older adults and uh, hence those with multiple chronic conditions. was the Affordable Care Act in about uh, 20 slides or so. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so at this point, um, I'm sure how to turn this back over uh, to Karen. <laughs> That's great. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Malone, you much. for that extremely interesting overview, super relevant, and I'm sure we're all waiting uh, with bated breath to see what comes of the uh, uh, ACA within the next few weeks and months. Um, now we'll turn it over to Dr. Chung, and she's going to talk about um, her work uh, in the Aging Initiative Pilot Project.
subject looking at Medicare preventive visit coverage benefits and effects of the ACA policy changes on older adults with MCCs. If anybody has questions for Dr. Malone, we'll be taking them at the end. Please feel free to submit them to the Q&A section now, and we will get to them after Dr. Chung's uh, talk. Thank you. Hello. Can everyone see those slides now? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for attending this slide, and thank you for um, Aging Initiative uh, giving the opportunity to present my work. Um, put into context, um, Dr. Malone uh, um, discussed the scope and of the Affordable Care Act and the impact on briefly impact on all the adults. And uh, my work is the what those the main part or not very highlighted um, a bit of um, uh, what the Affordable Care Act uh, made was uh, Medicare expansion of preventive visit coverage. And um, my presentation will be mostly on how it, I mean, in, in, when, in, in my organization, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, how that coverage uh, took impact, uh, mostly in critical work of the um, data analysis. So it's quite different from <laughs> Dr. Mello's presentation. Brief review. Trinity for service in Medicare is for diagnosis and treatment, and, but not much for preventive services. Um, theoretically, preventive care needs can be addressed during routine primary care visits. But um, more pressing needs for addressing acute and chronic health conditions leaves a little time for preventive care. So, implicit preventive visit coverage can increase time devote, devoted to prevention in primary care. So, uh, that's the rationale. So, Medicare first introduced welcome to care visit in 2005. Uptake has been very low. Many months, the eligibility window was very narrow, which was first six months of payment, plus there was substantial out-of-pocket cost. And the documentation requirements to build a visit were too uh, burdensome. Then in 2011, there was a big change in coverage. The co was eliminated, so it became free, and the benefit is not limited only to the first year of the enrollment, but it is now annual perpetual. The annual part is named as um, annual wellness visit. So, uh, Medicare card preventive visits are required to cover a wide range of preventive services, including medical, family, uh, medical and family history review, and biometrics for cognitive impairment, depression, functional ability, reviewing screening services, planning end-of-life care, education counseling, and referral for other personalized preventive services. It is um, designed to help identify conditions that are particularly important for older adults. So expected that taking care of preventive needs in doing this um, dedicated visit, routine primary care visits can be more effective in managing existing conditions. So, uh, with the funding from Aging Initiative study, uh, we sought to understand what is the impact of the, the Medicare's preventive visit coverage first on the realization of preventive visit itself. We expect that there is an increase, there would be an increase. It not necessarily translate into true increase in preventive care if those visits simply replace privately paid preventive visits or non-preventive um, routine primary care visits. I mean the, the extent to which the substitution took place. And second, by the subgroup of patients who are more likely to make preventive visits and assess whether the gap in utilization has been reduced by the coverage expansion. Subgroups, we focus on age and comorbid conditions and insurance type. 
So our hypothesis was that seniors with multiple chronic conditions or who are very old are less likely to make a premature visit as they are overall overwhelmed by um, frequent um, medical appointments and um, limited mobility. But the impact of coverage would have been greater in these groups. They examined whether the change in preventive visits actually improved the condition of recommended preventive services. Oh. And so, setting is Palo Alto Medical Foundation, a large multi specialty mixed pair group practice in Northern California. A contract with a group of multi specialty and, and physicians, um, uh, 1,500 physicians who serve more than a million patients a year. Uh, from election health records, and, um, part of a starter health, uh, which has a comprehensive, constantly expanding HR system. Includes scheduling, billing, and patient demographics, and the encounter information. So that is the main data source uh, we use for the study. So patients who are aged 65 to 85 with any insurance coverage. Limited the sample to users of primary care services we find who may made any visit to internal medicine or family medicine in the current or previous year. Um, because PAMF is not an HMO, we don't have the enrollment information for a major, majority of patients because the demo constitutes about 20% or less. So it depends on the study sample based on the utilization. And all the analysis I'll present in um, the following slide. A of analysis was patient in the year. At the period, on average, we see the table. Um, percent of patients here made a preventive visit. Um, and three is uh, racially diverse uh, for African Americans. For comorbidities, we used um, Charleston Comorbidity Index to capture the burden of comorbidities. So the question, does the increase in Medicare coverage lead to increased previous relation? Um, difference in differences of approach. Compared to preventive visit during three years before and three years after the introduction of annual wellness visit, that is one difference. And um, the the trend among the traditional fee-for-service Medicare in Louis was compared with the contemporaneous trend for people of the same age range in the same group, but with insurance types, Medicare HMO, and private fee-for-service and private HMO. There's an incomparable difference in utilization among patients with other insurance as well, then uh, this just that um, an impact is uh, also Medicare policy change. So there are issues on the rates of Medicare covered versus privately um, paid preventive visits by patient insurance type. So on Medicare fee for service in all ways, the Medicare covered preventive visit, which is um, in the height of red bars, Increased from 1.5% um, before 2011 to more than 30% in 2013. At the time, the rate of preventive is not covered by Medicare, which is the height of uh, turquoise bars, decreased substantially. So, come the overall rate of preventive visit for this group doubled. Another, but much smaller, but still statistically significant increase among uh, people with the Medicare HMO of the, the increase in um, a, uh, annual wellness visit in this group as well. 
Well, Medicare HMOs include uh, preventive visits in a benefit package, so there's no economic incentives to use more of these new visit codes. But um, the Medicare's uh, promotion of annual wellness visit may have influenced the trend in this group. The rate increased slightly for people with uh, private pay for service, but decreased slightly for private HMO patients during this period. So um, overall, um, the increase in preventive visit among people service Medicare patients was significantly larger than the increase among other groups in the same organization. Currently, um, even though there's a steep increase in this group and uh, preventive visits, they still receive far uh, less uh, preventive visits compared to other um, other people with other insurance. Then um, another case is just does uh, this, this, this uh, annual wellness visit just a substitute for existing primary care visits, or does it add to other visits? So, uh, the, um, in this chart. Uh, the light um, green bars shows that the non-preventive primary care visits, so that rate decreased among Medicare fee services in release. The, the, but uh, this visit decreased among other insurance types as well, very degree. So over suggest that um, there have been organization-wide changes in practice patterns unrelated to Medicare coverage during this decade. Um, well, statistically speaking, the reduction in the, these non-preventive primary care visits among Medicare fee-for-service patients was actually smaller than the reduction among um, Medicare HMO patients, but it was greater than so overall, Medicare preventive visit replaced some other preventive visits, but not the routine primary care visit. And second question: How does the preventive visit coverage differ among subgroups? We use the generalized linear model with random effect from 2007 to 2014. And the variable was an indicator of where a patient made a preventive visit or not given a year. For relevant patient demographic and clinical characteristics and provider characteristics. In addition to the overall sample analysis, I also ran separate analysis for pre versus post-annual wellness visit period to assess whether any disparity in preventive visit use narrowed or widened with this coverage. So we found that um, um, the result is very, very clear. Uh, most of the variables included in this um, analysis were very statistically significant. The positive predictors were um, younger age, these are um, patients with age 65 to 85. And Asians, as compared to non Hispanic whites, and post 2011, of course, and insurances, especially Medicare HMOs, as compared to Medicare fee for service. And female provider and providers in internal medicine versus family medicine. Converse negative predictors were older age, Latino, and having more comorbidities. And, oh, we, it's not here, but we ran um, a slightly different model with covariate of frequent primary care visits as um, covariate, and it was negative predictor. But uh, we did include it here because um, um, it's multi with a uh, number of comorbidities. So the, part, um, the possible explana explanation is that those frequent users who are like to have multiple comorbid conditions, 
maybe some some of needed preventive care during their routine visit, which is a hypothesis, but we haven't explored that yet. And sure, um, this shows the, the result from the separate analysis for pre and post annual wellness period. Here, the blue dots and confidence intervals are the result from the, the pre period and red or from post period. And pre annual wellness visit period, patients who are aged 50 to 85 were much less likely to make a preventive visit than those aged 65 to 69. Um, the average ratio is about 0.5. But to post to the period, the difference is smaller, so the average ratio is about 0.7. So the age reduces substantially after the coverage. On the other hand, um, the difference in um, utilization of preventive visit based on number of comorbidities um, didn't change. It is uh, this uh, pre and post um, those who have multiple more uh, comorbidities are much less likely to make a pre visit, and the gap didn't reduce. And by insurance type, pre period Medicare fee for service beneficiaries are much less likely to prevent a visit compared to those with care HMO, about eight. During post period, it's about three. So there's a huge decline in gap um, based on insurance type. So third question. Does it use lead to increase the uptake of recommended preventive care? Again, use the GRM with patient random effect. Um, for each previous services, which I will show next slide, we ran separate model with patient, and each model dependent variable was an indicator of whether the patient met the recommended target or not. So we tried preventive care in three categories, preventive screening and management of existing conditions, and preventive counseling. So colorectal cancer screening and breast cancer screening um, assessed each year where an individual patient was up to date for the recommendation or not. And for secondary, monitoring of persistent medications and needed diabetes care were um, also um, assessed annually among eligible patients. A meeting target for smoking cessation counseling and discussion of end of life care planning uh, is that each of these is done and checked in the EHR at any visit during the year. So here is the finding. Um, the y axis shows the rate of completion or up to date for the recommended care for each uh, type of service. And the girls are overall average, and blue are for those who did not make a preventive visit during a year, yellow bars for those who did make a preventive visit. These rates are predicted values based on the regression model, controlling for all other relevant factors. Those of these categories, seniors who made a preventive visit were significantly more likely to have um, completed the recommended services than those who did not. And the difference is the largest for smoking cessation um, sleeping and the discussion of end of life care. And uh, followed by uh, colorectal cancer screening and breast cancer screening. And this is uh, smallest for monitoring of uh, persistent medications. And this sense, 
sense because um, the discussion of smoking cessation and advanced care planning are time consuming and difficult to be dealt with during um, the um, focused visits. And also, discussion about risk and benefits of colorectal and breast cancer screening um, options uh, take time. So, so they, they can be handled better in a preventive visit. And management of chronic conditions typically are addressed to non-preventive visits, so the effect of additional preventive visits is um, smallest. So we compared the likelihood of make, being each target based on the frequency of pre preventive visits and the frequency of non-preventive primary care visits. So in this chart, what is this predicted probability of meeting the target as before? And x-axis shows the frequency of non-preventive prime care visits. The red uh, and uh, marks are the values for those who made a preventive visit and blue for those who did not. So for discussion of smoking cessation and uh, end of life care planning, the predicted probabilities were significantly larger for those who made preventive visits and those who did not, regardless of the frequency of non-preventive primary care visits. So for example here, the um, likelihood of having a discussion of end of life care planning those who made a preventive visit only, well, 1%, which is about 10 percentage point larger than the rate among those who made four or more non-preventive primary care visits only. This is the last dra dramatic, but, but still significant for being up to date in colorectal cancer and breast cancer screening. Screening rates were significantly larger for those who made a preventive visit than those who did not, regardless of the frequency of non preventive visit, primary visit. Both um, the predicted the predicted rate is about um about um, three percentage points larger for those who made a preventive visit only than those who made four or more non-preventive primary care visits only. So one thing to note here is that um, people um, who did not make any primary care visits in here, like this, this preventive pre, um, care visits, they still have um, Quite a high rate of completion. It's um, because um, uh, screening procedures are not all uh, recommended annually, but with long period uh, intervals so, uh, for colonoscopy every 10 years. So we included in this sample those who are active primary care patients, which is defined as only one primary care visit in the current or previous year, so they may, must have received in the past years. Um, also, these procedures could have been done uh, by specialists. And as expected, non-preventive visits had stronger impact on meeting targets for management of chronic conditions. Here, one preventive visit only is equivalent to about two non non preventive private primary care visits in managing the target, but one preventive visit did not make a difference for those who made two or more preventive primary care visits. So, so in summary, um, pre visit rate among Medicare fee for service employees doubled. With um, eight days coverage expansion, but it is still much lower than the rate among Medicare HMO in the list and other insurers in the list. And since who are older and have more comorbid conditions are much less likely to make a preventive visit. 
and um, preventive visit use increased more among older seniors, reducing the, the age-based gap. But patients with multiple comorbidities did not utilize the, the service as much as those who so did not have those multiple comorbidities. So, so the gap um, persisted. And who made a preventive visit more, or they were more likely to be up to date for recommended preventive services, and the difference was prominent for time consuming services. And for services, frequent non preventive primary care visits do not really offset the improvement in preventive care associated with one preventive visit. So, conclusion um, Medicare explicit coverage of preventive visit through annual wellness visit improved the use of recommended preventive care among all the adults. And the coverage reduced the gap in, uh, in preventive visit rates among seniors based on age and insurance, but not on, based on um, health conditions. But all, um, even though gap reduced the um, of disparity uh, based on age and by insurance type, was still um, substantial. And other adults who were already making frequent medical visits, a dedicated preventive visit can still improve um, the uptake of mandated and particularly time consuming preventive care services. Um, and the preventive care coverage should remain a priority for Medicare in order to address prevent the needs of an aging population. Uh, pilot study has led me to be interested in um, uh, addressing more questions in this area of research. For example, how does the increase uh, preventive visit use change primary care practice in general? Um, as the preventive care needs are handled in a separate visit, non-preventive routine problem-focused visits can be more, more effective. And this may be particularly for, uh, true for um, seniors with multiple comorbid conditions. And well, um, although the the preventive visit rates increased a lot, so seniors are far under utilizing the services. So, well, research can be done to understand the, what are the barriers among patients and practitioners in in using these services. And the question is, uh, is visit worthwhile in terms of improving, improving um, patient-centered outcomes? We, in, in this pilot stage, we only looked at the clinical quality metrics, but, but, but um, annual visit is intended to address issues that matter most to seniors, such as the prevention of falls and detecting, managing uh, depression and cognitive impairment, so um, that aspect should be explored as well. And um, uh, my colleague um, Cheryl Phelps at uh, PAMP Research Institute and I have applied for a query grant to pursue this, um, and our fingers are crossed. And um, yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Dr. Sasha Darlin at uh, KP Washington, she, she guided me at an earlier stage of the, this um, project development. I thank the funders, AA Through Aging Initiative and AHRQ for my career development award. Thank you. Did um, can someone take? Mm -hmm. Dr. Chang. Mm -hmm. um, so, any questions? Um, you can put them in through the Q and A. Um, as a reminder, everyone is, is muted to save us from um, some potential background noise. But I, our speakers are ready to answer questions in the next twenty or so minutes that we have.
a question here for Dr. Chung. Uh, for what reasons do you think that older adults with multiple comorbidities are less likely to utilize annual wellness visits be the high rate of contact with healthcare care providers? Oh, that's a great question. That was the, um, the main question uh, for this pilot study, and we really couldn't understand, dig into that part yet. We saw that, I mean, the hypothesis was they are um, making frequent visits, and those preventive care needs are covered during their routine visits. So and also, most of them, I mean, many of them are um, having limited mobility and a lot of visits, and that's um, so they less will make a separate visit for for prevent prevent. And we hypothesize that the country may have brought them in separate visit so that their routine visit can be more effective in managing multiple conditions, but we did. All this explicit coverage uh, is not enough to, I mean, this economic incentive is not enough to bring them in. And yeah, those relatively healthier um, are more utilizing this um, preventive visit. I mean, this annual wellness visit is more geared toward the things with a lot of functional um, or cognitive impairment and those. So, it needs to be, uh, I practice at this level, should it be addressed to to really address that issue fully and um, make um, those who have multiple conditions to be more aware and, and um, get the benefit. And so that that is actually the yeah, next question we have we put together for, for the PICURI grant. Uh, what's really going on during that visit? Is it really fully addressed to those um, um, different issues for the seniors and how the patient perceive that this preventive visit, especially those who have already had uh, multiple visits. So the great question is still, um, I'm still speculative. Great. Well, can can you hear me? Yep. Okay, this is Heather with them. Somehow I got disconnected earlier when I was trying to ask a question. Um, Thanks so much to, to both of for two really um, outstanding and, and really thought-provoking talks. So my question is about, um, it, I guess it's a question for, for each of you, but it, it seems like to me for, for patients with multiple chronic conditions, um, the, the pay for performance or pay for value is kind of like the holy grail, um, but it's also so difficult to characterize what is value for a patient with multiple chronic conditions, um, and that's partly due to the fact that we know that for some people, their preferences change, um, and multi people with multiple chronic conditions is a driver of preference changes um, and goal changes in, in care goals, but it's also not an absolute, so it's difficult to say that just because a person has a high multiple chronic condition that that they will necessarily have transitioned to a different sort of preference. So, you know, but one of the things that really struck me was that, that you found that patients with multiple chronic conditions are less likely to, to, to take advantage of the service. And also, even for those who do take advantage of, of the annual wellness visit, uh, the, the um, sort of preference type discussion about end of life and preferences is the least likely thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And that seems like such a shame and such a missed opportunity to me that, that I do think that the reason that it doesn't happen is it's less than that you can check a box. Well, there's probably another number of reasons that it doesn't happen. But I wonder if just comment on um, maybe one, Dr. Malone kind of to comment on um, efforts of underway to try to sort of um, put some kind of metric or measure on what value in these multiple chronic conditions and how do you determine what, what people care to one patient or another. And um, your thoughts, maybe Dr. Chung, about, um, you know, um, what could be done to potentially increase utilization, particularly of the um, life 
life plane. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps if Catherine can pull up the slide that's uh, number four, uh, or else she can switch over the control back. Should I go back over to the uh, share my screen? You should get there. Sure. Um, so I was talking, I, I like looked at this particular slide, and uh, it speaks to the issues of um, on writing to care for those with multiple advanced illnesses or with the, with an advanced illness or those with multiple conditions. And, you know, it, it started to highlight some of the values about uh, working with those families and with the patients about determining what their values are and what they're uh, important to them and how to frame, how to address their needs needs the development of a uh, plan that uh, outlines strategies to implement uh, uh, addressing their their preference and then coordinating that care and um, engaging the patient. So it's still there may be opportunities for us to improve um, I, I, are by focusing in uh, on those, uh, let's say, uh, behaviors that were, uh, and I believe by Chad Bolt and others in this, uh, in this paper, and um, it, that uh, would be uh, of interest. And I believe that uh, doctors uh, Marinetti and, and Carolyn Blom uh, in there work that was initially called Caroline, um, but I believe they switched more towards value-based care or something like that. It, um, their work kind of focuses in on some of these um, uh, important behaviors that are uh, generally uh, embraced by uh, geriatric medicine. My, my first thoughts. Um. So I can only um, just do uh, my thought, opinion, but um, the list of things to do to be covered during annual wellness visit is very, very long. And, and this kind of life planning is lengthy, I mean, it's, it's long discussion. And actually the rate I saw is uh, um, what I thought it would happen. Um, uh, actually my colleague at here, uh, Pam Free, uh, she's looking at advanced directive and other um, the end of life care planning uh, discussion in the EHR chart and the documentation actually in depth documentation is very low and where I looked at the data is uh, just checkbox if it's done and uh, their interviews and EHR um, analysis shows that the uh, who made annual wellness visit and whose box is checked, they really remember if anything has happened. So, I mean, it's a, it's a huge barrier. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time for primary care physicians. Even there's a 40 minute, 45 minute annual wellness visit scheduled. There are things to cover. And they practice um, in the practice side, set priorities and uh, what is most, I mean, the Medicare billing requirement has um, has to met, but setting priorities and what really needs to be covered during the visit and bring um, those people in for specific purposes may may have better a uh, trend and, and people may feel more um, think the visit was worthwhile. That may be one approach I, I can think of. And, and again, it, it's very time consuming. Task. And those um, like nurses and nurse practitioners and those the clinicians uh, should uh, who can build the visit can, should be involved in, in this offering this annual wellness visit and then another approach to to.
provide this care more thoroughly could on prior care visit I mean the physicians are really over overbooked. I mean it's their time wise it have to pay it I mean have to uh, uh some some uh, appointment slots for acute problem focused visits. So that additional resources um um is definitely required for more um other uh, focused pre pre uh, preventive visits, in my opinion. That was um, responses from both of you. Um, so um, uh, if there's uh, anyone else um, that has questions, I have not seen any come up yet. yet. I'll give just for any of those to pop up or let me know if she sees some that I'm missing somewhere. Any? Okay. And then in that case, I think we will go ahead and um, end our call for the day. And I just want to once again um, thank both of the speakers um, for really um, not um, good and informative talks, but obviously very timely. Um, um, and I appreciate uh, both of you for, for sharing your, your expertise with us. Um, everyone should be able to see now that if there are um, questions, um, to please feel free to contact um, Catherine, um, and hopefully it'll be okay if she does forward any additional questions that, re re that we receive on to you. That'll be great. Thank you. All right. Thanks to both of you.